stuff I got Not a problem. Okay. Can everybody get seated, please? Welcome to our last uh, session. I'm Mary Chase Solick, and I'm on the faculty here at North Park Seminary. Uh, in this last session, we're going to be uh, hearing first from uh, Lewis Brogdon, Assistant Professor of Religion and Biblical Studies at Claflin University in South Carolina, who's going to be talking about reimagining koinonia, confronting the legacy and logic of racism in the light of Paul's letter to Philemon. And our response is going to be from Al Tizan, our Executive Minister of Serve Globally for the Evangelical Covenant Church. So we welcome Dr. Claflin, Dr. Brogdon. Well, good afternoon. Well, there's a saying that says they save uh, the best for last. <laughs> it has been a full uh, two days of reflection and thinking, excellent papers. And so I know there is a bit of uh, fatigue at this hour, especially considering many of you just uh, had lunch. <laughs> but I pray that uh, in this last session that um, God will be with us, uh, with our deliberations, and that we'll bear some fruit out of our time together. So if you don't mind, I would like to open up with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, as the psalmist declares, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you because this is a day of purpose. We thank you for calling us to this place and at this time. During a time when so much is going on in this country and around the world given us these few days to step back, to reflect, to think anew, and to even dream of new ways to be more faithful to the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So take our meager attempts, take our thoughts and reflections, and know our hearts, that we're willing to be here together amidst the messiness of issues of race and racism, 
we know you are yet able to use us to continue to do your will. Now anoint me to teach. I ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to just open up briefly with a, a quick story. There is a very popular saying in the African American religious tradition, uh, i.e. Uh, the black church, that when they're talking about what is heaven like, one of the popular expressions is that every day will be like Sunday. And I remember as a little boy, because <laughs> you know, my, my mother was, uh, my mother's a preacher. She's been a preacher for well over 40 years. And I remember going down to the kitchen and I was like, Mom, I want to ask you a question. I, what is heaven like? And, you know, Mom starts telling me about how, uh, you know, we're in the Pentecostal tradition where it's a place of rejoicing. We're going to rejoice. We're going to sing. We're going to shout and, uh, and, and, and be with God. And in my uh, naive mind, I was thinking about, oh, no, heaven's going to be like being in church forever. <laughs> And as, as I was sitting there contemplating within myself, I, I was like, I know I don't want to go to hell. I mean, I, I, I know that. But the thought of being in church for eternity was, that was not a good thought for me. But as I have grown older, I've come to realize that this sort of sabbatical understanding of what it means to be the church, this idea that every day being like Sunday has not so much to do with church services, but that Sunday has historically been the time where um, African Americans would just be together. Uh, they would be together with one another, uh, with God, uh, and in one of the few places African Americans have historically felt safe which is why I have chosen to use as a springboard for our discussion of Paul's letter to Philemon, I wanted to use the, the tragic shootings uh, at Mother Emanuel uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, because that struck a nerve in the African American community, because historically the church has been one of the safest spaces for blacks to go uh, a place where we could say it, it's, it's our space, it's a welcoming space. Uh, so to have that space uh, violated and for that space to be a place uh, of death and profound pain, I think requires our reflection and deliberation uh, at an event like this. And so I will do my best to talk about some of these things. What I want to do is basically make uh, three moves in my presentation. Uh, first, I want to sort of use the shootings at Mother Emanuel as a springboard to talk about deeper problems, because I believe that uh, the, way in, the ways in which Dylan Roof thought that many white Americans sort of shared this sort of ideology, this logic um, about race and about what it means when you cross lines of race. Then I will use that to transition into um, an exploration of a, a small New Testament letter, Paul's letter to Philemon, and a term that has come near and dear to my heart in the past few years, and that term is koinonia, often translated as fellowship. And I think it's a, a very apropos follow-up to the previous uh, presentation we've had because we're struggling to find, well, how do we refer to ourselves? How, you know, how, how do we, you know, is, is it race? Is it ethnicity? Is it culture? Uh, I want to draw on some of the imagery from the New Testament to explore um, ways that we can be faithful together. And then the last move will be to just uh, explore the relevance of this small letter for the church today. Uh, so let's begin. I just wanted uh, you to uh, see the faces I think just two weeks ago, uh, I went back down to Mother Emmanuel to take some pictures. I hope that uh, I want to do a small documentary of, of getting uh, black and white uh, religious scholars to sit down and to uh, unpack this event. But it's always good to see faces uh, with names as well. 
Reverend Clementa Pickney, Tawanza Sanders, Sharonda Singleton, who is a uh, ordained minister herself, Cynthia Hurd, Reverend DePayne Middleton Doctor, Ethel Lance, Susie Jackson, Mira Thompson, and Reverend, Reverend Daniel Simmons Jr. They, like many other African Americans, uh, I think the night was June, Seventeenth, uh, they were in church having Bible study and prayer. And in the sort of tradition of the African American church, it's an open door policy. You know, anybody can come in. Dylan Roof walks in, and he is immediately welcomed. Uh, he is so, hey, have a seat. We're here praying. We're uh, having Bible study. Uh, he asked for Reverend Pickney. Where is the pastor? They showed him where he was, and he wanted to sit close to the pastor. And so he sat with uh, the Charleston Nine. He sat with them for about an hour. Uh, it is mind-blowing how you can sit in there for an hour uh, as the word of God is being taught and as people are praying. Uh, one of the survivors uh, reported that uh, the shooting started when they began to bow their heads for prayer. His name was Dylan Roof. He stood up and he said, I came here to shoot black people. Uh, one young man, uh, Tawanza Sanders, uh, he pleaded with him not to do this. Uh, his reply was this. You're raping our women. You're taking over. And you have to go. So what I talk about in the, the introduction of my paper is that this reference to raping women, he was not talking about real rape. He wasn't talking about uh, incidents of rape between uh, African-American men and white women, for example. Uh, this idea of, of raping women was a reflection of his repudiation, his disdain at the thought of interracial relationships, of blacks and whites uh, loving one another. Uh, this idea of you're taking over is going against the logic of race, which says, you know, everyone has their place. And in a sort of white supremacist context, it's not the place of, you know, minorities to be in positions of authority, to be in positions of influence, to be in positions where the majority culture even has to relate to them. But things have changed in this country. There's even an African American in the White House. I mean, there is, it's hard to get around and away from the diversity that we see in this country, but everyone's not happy about it. And so I am an exegete. I believe that words matter. That when people say things, they say things for a reason. And so I wanted to exegete exactly what he was saying and what he was getting at. Uh, and so I believe that part of what he is getting at is this idea that it is wrong for blacks and whites and all people uh, to relate in, in a very in, in intimate ways. It goes against the, the logic uh, of racism. And so what I tried to do was to, to give you a less technical reflection of what I believe is racist ideology. This project is the beginning of, I've been, doing, I've been working on this for about two years. I'm sure I'll be thinking about it for quite a few more years before I write a book dealing with the issue of, of segregation in the church. So I have a lot of thinking to do about what we are going to do with this animal. That um, the eschatological vision of heaven is not racialized, it's not segregated, there's not, you know, a side of heaven for the blacks, there's not a side of heaven for uh, the Latinas, the Latinos, the Hispanics, not a side of heaven for, <laughs> you know, for, for the Asian, We're, we will all be together. And if in the model prayer we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then we have a lot of work to do because we don't know how to be together on earth. <laughs> Uh, and so, how do we prepare for uh, the realization of that apocalyptic vision? So, I, you know, I tried to find a way to, to summarize the ideology of racism in a way that I can teach it in churches. Because part of, what, part of my challenge to religious leaders 
is that until we stop talking about this in just academic circles and we start talking about this in the church, we are not going to see change. So part of the problem with critical race theory is that it's a discourse among the elites. Okay, it's a discourse among the academics. Uh, what I'm concerned with is who is preaching on these issues in their churches? Uh, who's willing to do Bible study series? And I challenge not just uh, my white sisters and brothers, but I challenge my African American sisters and brothers the same way. That we have to, we have, because part of dealing with the legacy of racism uh, is you have to unlearn things. <laughs> You know, you have to learn how to, uh, to use a sort of Pauline motif to, uh, have a, to experience transformation through the renewing of your mind. You have to reprogram the way you think about everything. Uh, uh, that's what it means to, to repent. It is, it is to experience transformation in a very profound way. And it is ongoing, okay? So I tried to find a way to talk, that I can talk about the ideology of racism in a church. And so there you have it before you. I'm not going to read through each point, but I just I want to highlight two points. Says one, you have one race, the blacks there are in inferior. You have a superior race of whites. You have this idea that everyone has a place within society. So part of racist ideology is, you know, there, it's a hierarchy. Okay, people who are high up. They should be doing the things that require a lot of thinking, important roles, um, and, and people who, you know, maybe are not as intellectually gifted as some of the people of the other races. Well, you know, they have strong backs, and they can run fast. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, so everyone kind of has a place. That, that's, that's racist ideology. And people get socialized into this. So uh, I have fun teaching at a historic black college disrupting some of these ideologies. Uh, when I tell African American men that, you know, there is more, you, you have more value than being a good athlete, uh, you know, or, or, or an entertainer. You know, you can be an educator, a thinker. <laughs> okay, and then they're kind of sitting there looking because they're just used to being socialized. Uh, you know, well, I can run, I can shoot, and I can catch, and, you know, don't fit into those boxes. But there's also this belief that the races should be divided, that everyone should just stay with their own people, that marriage and family, social and religious intercourse, they are um, forbidden. Now, the easy thing for us to do is to pretty much say, oh, you know, Dylan Roof is an extremist. The hard thing is to, is to understand that part of the ways in which he thinks is more widespread than we care to admit. Dylan Roof was reared in a Lutheran church in Columbia, South Carolina. So part of our, uh, our documentary work, and we're going to be doing a conference in January, is we're doing our best to try to engage the pastor of that church uh, in, uh, in Columbia to uh, have conversations uh, about what has happened. Because Roof's parents have yet to come out and publicly denounce what he has done. Uh, if, if, if my son were to participate in a heinous act like that, I would publicly come out and even though I would admit that, that he's my son, I love my son, but we did not teach that in my house, okay? <laughs> you know, I would make sure that, that, that we're clear, but, a, but, but there's been nothing but silence from the church, silence from his family. The only one who has spoken out publicly has been his uncle. But there have been signs all the way back to the 90s that there are many whites who are opposed to crossing certain lines. Uh, in the early 90s, a, a very popular Word of Faith teacher, uh, Ken Hagen Jr., in a sermon, told his church, we can be friends with them, but we do not date or marry them. Uh, and when that tape was given to Fred Price, who was a very, very close friend to, to the Hagens, uh, Fred Price wanted him to publicly denounce uh, these statements. Uh, Hagen was only willing to say he was sorry. It was unfortunate that, he, that it was misunderstood what he was trying to say. <laughs> then in a personal conversation, uh, Ken Hagen's wife looked at the Prices and says, but we don't think that way of you all. 
So Price went on national television for months and dealt with the legacy of race and racism in the church. I mean, if, who, who remembers this? I mean, it was a powder keg in the Pentecostal charismatic arena, you know, with all these folks who thought after the miracle in Memphis that uh, racism had went away in Pentecostalism, you know, when you had the white brothers say, oh, we're sorry, we're, you know, we're sorry about, you know, all that slavery and stuff, Jim Crow, my bad. And, and they got out it, you know, and thought, thought it was over, you know, wash some feet, and, and that's it, okay? But they, did, they didn't do any of the work to undo and to address the ideology. Uh, Bob Jones, until, what, the year 2000, okay? If you, in the late 90s, if you fell in love across the lines of race, you couldn't go to that Christian institution. Uh, and then more recently, a Pew study has found that uh, ev evangelicals are the most opposed to interracial marriage, okay? And they have the most negative views. Now, they're not far ahead what's what you're going to find in the main line uh, in the Catholic Church. But evangelicals, they're, they're the most opposed, and they will even go as far as to say that it is actually bad. Uh, a recent phone survey among Southern Baptists found that, you know, they're against integrating their churches. They believe it's best um, that the whites stay in their churches, the blacks stay uh, in their churches. So the logic of racism, it is still uh, very much with us. Now, people, y y you're going to have to, the church really has to get a clue. Because there are people who are falling in love and are experiencing family across the lines of race. And part of this, you know, people wonder about what's going on with all the, this, the younger demographic and, uh, and, and, their, and the fact that they're leaving churches. It's one of the reasons is because, you know, they don't buy into all the ideology from the older generation. So there are a lot of young Christians who are in interracial relationships and they don't have a church to go to. Is going to, to, to affirm them because what a church is going to do with that? Because as uh, Dr. Medina was talking about, for example, we're so locked into the black-white binary, what happens when you cross those lines? What happens when you fall in love with someone who is a descendant of the people who were oppressing you? <laughs> oh, it is quiet in here. <laughs> <laughs> So the fact that the churches are not welcoming places for people who cross these lines, uh, there were people who will even give you theological arguments as to why you, you should not cross those lines. Okay. Uh, I believe they have a distorted vision of Christianity. That's, that is a part of the legacy of racism. Uh, and so a quote that has been with me ever since seminary comes from Howard Thurman, who this comes from the book Jesus and the Disinherited. If you've never read this book, uh, please write the title down, Jesus and the Disinherited. It is an excellent book. This book was so important that uh, Dr. King carried around his briefcase throughout uh, the freedom struggle. Okay? It was a book he went back and read over and over again. I have read that book so many times, and every time I read it, I'm getting something new from it. He asks a question. He says, why is it that Christianity seems impotent to deal radically and therefore effectively with issues of discrimination and injustice on the basis of race? Why do Christians suck at dealing with race? That's what he's saying. <laughs> if we've been transformed, if we've been blood bought, if we've been filled with the Holy Spirit, and all this rich language from uh, the New Testament, for example, if we've been transformed, why does that not translate into dealing with issues of race? Part of the problem with the legacy of race and racism in the church, uh, in, in America, is the Christian church. Uh, not being prophetic and out ahead. So he, he asked the question, is it because we betray the genius of the religion? Or is it there something inherent about the religion itself that enables us not to be able to deal effectively with it? I try to argue that, well, I, I believe we betray the genius of the Christian religion. Now, it is because of this quote that you get this very popular term that says, the 11 o'clock hour is what? Most 
or segregated hour of the week. I would amend that by saying the 11 o'clock hour and many other hours after that. <laughs> okay, we're, we're very, we're deeply segregated. Uh, and the push and the trends are towards more segregation. Okay, there is a clear rejection of, of integration in America right now. We want, for, for various reasons, to continue to be segregated. Uh, this is why I turn to scholars like uh, Willie Jennings, who says a lot of times when we try to narrate why we have black churches and white churches and Hispanic churches and Asian American churches, the, the common way is to say, well, the, they're just different cultural expressions of Christianity. But Jennings wants to argue that the real problem is that we have a diseased social imagination. We cannot even imagine <laughs> worshiping across the lines of race in a, in a substantive manner. Uh, we have made almost no progress. And, and, and people who do studies on multicultural churches will show you. Multicultural churches, they will start out diverse, but in about 10 years, they go back to being a, a monocultural church. So how do we even sustain this uh, is... I think is yet to be determined. So this is why I, 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 I sincerely believe that part of living into change is we have to be taught differently. We have to learn how to think differently, which is why the term koinonia has been uh, so important to me. I think it's one of the terms that can help us dream differently. And if there's any dream I have for MDiv students, don't lose your imagination. Don't let the, don't let, um, the rigor uh, rob you of the, the imagination that brought you to, uh, to the task of theological education because we need you to dream. We need you not to lose hope. We need you not to buy into the fact that things cannot change. Things can change um, if you learn how to, to dream and to draw deeply on uh, the Christian tradition. And as a New Testament scholar, I would say, drink deeply from the well of scripture. So koinonia den denotes participation. It is often translated as fellowship in texts such as um, Acts 2, 1 Corinthians 9, Philemon 6. Uh, Paul uses the term 13 times to denote religious fellowship or participation uh, of the believer to Christ and for mutual fellowship among believers. So I like to argue that koinonia is, it is like a spiritual bond we have that we share that has been made possible because of the um, salvific work of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is made effectual through the work of the Holy Spirit. It works itself out in relationships among Christians, but it even has implications for how we relate to all people. This is why Paul will exhort the Galatians that as often as you have opportunity, do good unto all people, uh, especially those who are of the household of faith. So uh, there's something happens when a person encounters Christ. Uh, it changes them. They experience transformation uh, in very profound ways. And Paul's way of talking about this transformation, I, I, really, I like the, the Philippians text where he starts talking about basically his past and uh, how he was, he was from the tribe of, uh, of Benjamin, zealous for the law. He says, all these things that I have gained, he says, I count them as loss so that I may do what? Have the, uh, the knowledge, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. The, I, I love Marty Swords who helped me to understand the, the connotation of the Greek word skubalos, which when Paul says, I count all things as dung, okay, the the sort of English equivalent of that would be a very bad word that I can't say uh, out loud. Okay, he says it's doo-doo, it's crap, okay, it's nothing. All of that's nothing in comparison with the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. So there's a sort of making what is earthly, what is social, secondary to um, what one gains and, and who we are in Christ. But I think koinonia is also, is also multidirectional in that it speaks both to our vertical relationship to God 
and horizontal relationships with all people. And these relationships transcend categories of race. The bond with God and his son Jesus Christ should transform how we relate to all people. And I think it's a, challenge, it's, it's a challenging concept. Uh, it's radical, but I think it's something that has implications for helping us to imagine different ways of being together. Now, this is why I love Paul's letter to Philemon, which when I tell people I wrote a dissertation on Philemon, I get this look. <laughs> is, is that in the Bible? <laughs> yes, it's in the Bible. OK. <laughs> yes, it's in the Bible. Uh, what does it say, you know? I mean, okay, so this is a letter that in my years, and I've spent my entire life in the church, I've never heard a sermon preached on Philemon. Never. Okay. And if you know anything about the black preaching tradition, black preachers can find a sermon out of anything in the text. Okay, I mean, it blows my mind what they can do with, I mean, you're in church your entire life, and it's like, where, how did you, where did you get that from? <laughs> it, is, it is amazing, okay? That kind of imagination. But look, they don't deal with Philemon ever, okay? Okay, with, with all that preaching imagination and energy, they just, Paul's letter to Philemon is a book that they ignore. And I believe part of the reason they ignore, I think it's twofold. First, this letter has a bad history in the black community. This was one of the texts used to justify and to, to defend slavery. It's even linked to uh, leaders in the church getting behind the Fugitive Slave Act, which was telling slaves, you're breaking moral law, you're breaking spiritual laws when you run away. Okay, Paul sent the slave back, so you know, if you wanna make it to heaven, don't run away, be a good slave. And so when they would decide to catechize um, blacks, they would often preach from Paul's letter to Philemon. And sometimes the response from African Americans was to get up and to walk out when they started preaching like that. So it's a painful history. The second reason a lot of African Americans ignore this text is the dominant reading. Okay? You read most standard New Testament commentaries they accept the slave flight hypothesis. It says Onesimus was a runaway slave who stole something from his master. You know what those slaves do. They're always up to something. Okay. It doesn't matter the fact that how a person becomes a slave. That's not problematic. What's problematic is that you're not an honorable slave. You're going to steal. So they sort of accept this stereotype of a thieving slave. Steals something and runs away from his master and just meets up with Paul. And he becomes a Christian when he meets Paul in prison, and uh, Paul, not wanting to break Roman law, says he's going to send the slave back to his master. And so he tells Philemon, look, take the slave back, but don't treat him like a slave. Treat him like a brother. All right? Now, in, in, my, in my book on Philemon, I say the Christian interpreters fail both to challenge the practice of slavery and to apply a liberating hermeneutic to this letter. This goes all the way back to criticism. Interpreters using the slave flight hypothesis, they did not challenge slavery or seriously consider the possibility that it was contrary to Christian teaching. In some instances, interpreters explicitly endorsed the continuation of this practice. Some even argued that Christianity makes slaves better. She says, oh, don't worry about us. No, 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 don't worry, Roman Empire. Because if you Christianize a slave, they're a better slave. They're more honorable. They won't steal. They won't run away. So for over a century, the letter's applicability and theological value were inextricably linked to the practice of Christianized slavery, especially later antebellum interpretations of Philemon. So the link between the slave flight hypothesis and the suffering of enslaved Africans in America especially those who were captured and returned to their masters, makes this reading problematic. So surely there has to be a better way to read this letter. So I remember when I was in the library one night, it was about almost midnight, 
I, when you're in grad school, you're burning the midnight oil. And I just remember the question coming to my mind. Why was Onesimus not a Christian? If Philemon was this great master who was refreshing the hearts of the saints, why was his slave not converted? Why was Onesimus not converted until he left that house and met Paul in prison? So I used the lens of exclusion uh, to open up this letter in new ways. Because I believe the reason Paul wrote the letter to Philemon was not just so that Philemon can accept him back, but I think Paul was giving a mild rebuke to Philemon. Because I believe the reason Onesimus left that house was because of the way he was being treated by his master. And when I introduced this idea to one of the uh, scholars on my dissertation committee, well, it was news to him that it was possible that a slave master could be duplicitous. <laughs> well, it doesn't say it in the text. It's like, no, no, there, there, there's so much evidence. If you read uh, slave narratives, for example, um, that you can have a master who treats social peers fantastic. But someone who is considered beneath them treats them like crap. So I drew on uh, uh, slave narratives in particular, sort of, sort of drawing on African-American religious thought. But also, there's evidence of that even in the ancient world, that people thought very, did not think much uh, of slaves in the ancient world. So I believe that the master can have a different side. Um, plenty of evidence of this. Frederick Douglass says, I would rather have an unchristian master than a Christian master. He said, because Christian masters were the most abusive. <laughs> okay. okay, so, but if Paul is sending this letter, this letter is being publicly read, he does not want to humiliate Philemon, so he cannot be explicit. His rhetoric is loaded. Paul is very subtle. So I believe you should look at Paul's prayer, verses 4 through 7. I think you should look at it. Kind of like a compliment, a super, you know how they teach you in management, you give a compliment sandwich. Anybody know what a compliment sandwich is? You're getting ready to tell somebody something they're not good at on the job. Do you want to just bring them in the office and, and tell them, you know, you're terrible at this. You bring them in and say, you know, you're, you're such a hardworking person. You know, you come here at your own time every day. You know, some of these other employees around here, they don't show up on time. You start with something good. Um, but there's something I want to talk with you about. And you kind of talk with them about what you need to work with them with. And then you end on something positive. I think that's exactly what Paul was doing. He does not want to humiliate uh, Philemon. He wants to affect change in this situation. So I believe sandwiched between the compliments in verse 6, you have his prayer. That um, his understanding of koinonia will be made effectual. Uh, according to the faith that, uh, that we share in Christ. And so I believe in verse 6, that's a mild rebuke, a mild critique of how Philemon is relating to his slave. And there are other evidences of that. Verse 11, where he says, formerly he was useless to you, but he is, was useful. So the way you were viewing him uh, is different. My experience with Onesimus has been different uh, than your experience. I mean, He's so helpful, I don't, I don't even really want to send him back. But, you know, uh, I don't want to impose. So I'm, I'm going to send him back. Who, whom is my heart? Okay, I, I care deeply about him. I, I will send him back to you. And he says, perhaps he was separated for you for a while that you might have him back forever. No longer is just a slave, but as, but as a brother. So I believe verse 16 is where Paul gets radical, but I think verse 16 shows that the gospel can be both radical and it can accommodate to culture as well. So, so everyone's critique. Why didn't Paul challenge slavery in the Greco-Roman world? Okay, they, with what? What kind of system could they imagine that's an alternative? In, I mean, you know, in hindsight, we look back and say, well, we wish he would have did it. But I think Paul was trying to challenge slavery in the, in the realm where it was possible to, to affect change. And that was within the church. He wanted to eradicate uh, these sort of statuses that separate us. 
And so while he was not challenging slavery in the Greco-Roman world, he was trying to deal with the issue of eradicating slave status in the church. So he says, stop viewing him, treating him as just a slave, as an inanimate object, as a thing, a shadow, as a person to do meaning, you know, meaningless tasks. Do this, do that. Treat him uh, as a dear brother. And so I believe this is a, a, a reading of Philemon that can speak to the church in new ways. And I, wanna, and I outline five ways in the conclusion. I argue that it challenges Christian duplicity. Okay? It challenges the ways in which Christians can be egalitarian, loving, generous to people within their racial classification and then vindictive and mean-spirited and hateful to people in another racial classification. And then go to church and shout. That's just the sort of pastoral thing I, th I threw in there. <laughs> okay. White Christians can be duplicitous. Black Christians can be duplicitous as well as it relates to loving uh, and viewing others as sisters and brothers. So I believe this is a kind of letter that, that cuts us both ways, causes us to look at ways in which we're being duplicitous. Oh, you, you treat this person one way, but then you're treating another person different, but in Christ, we're what? We're one. Secondly, it challenges current practices of racial exclusion. So it challenges us to look at ways in which we are excluding people on the basis of race. I think if we're going to do anything with the issue of segregation in the church, more churches on both sides of the aisle are going to have to start opening their doors. I think it's too much of waiting for well, when you repent, when you acknowledge all this history, when justice comes flowing down like a river, then we'll have that conversation. Well, when is that going to happen? I mean, realistically. <laughs> okay, People are going to have to learn how amidst the messiness of this, to find ways to experience fellowship in deeper ways. But there's a third challenge, in, and it's the challenge of why Onesimus was not a Christian, because of the way he was being treated. And so my thesis was that exclusion impedes conversion. So that a lot of times people can't get to Jesus because of the way they're being treated. And we have groups of people who cannot accept the witness of, of Christianity because of the ways in which um, we betray what it means to be Christian because we're still so beholden to the color line. And for those of us who are in the evangelical tradition, do we want to do anything that impedes a person from seeing the light of Christ and hearing the good news of the gospel? I don't want to ever be an occasion for someone else to stumble. Fourthly, it challenges current views of people as useless or as racialized beings, less than people who are fearfully and wonderfully made, people who were created in the image of God. Um, I think it was profound that Paul, Paul must have treated Onesimus in such a way that was so qualitatively different that right there in a jail cell, Onesimus became and that's, that's very powerful. And then fourthly, I think it challenges the church not to absolutize social distinctions like race in the church. I use the language of eradicate. That is strong. And I'm, I'm thinking through that. But I believe this is a radical letter. And what Paul was asking Philemon to do was radical. Uh, to accept him back not as a black brother, not as a white brother, not as a Hispanic sister, not as an Asian sister, accepting them back first as a sister or brother in Christ, then all of the other ethnic, cultural, racial labels you want to add on after that, fine. But don't absolutize it. Don't make that normative. And that's going to be a challenge. Uh, so it's something that I'm getting a lot of kickback with from black scholars. Um, 
I think J. Cameron Carter did a great job of showing that some of, some of the Black Theology Project was the same logic uh, of white supremacists. It was just inverted. Jesus is white. No, Jesus is black. Uh, you, you know, it's like, well, okay, so really, and, and that becomes the discussion. Not what Jesus taught, not experiencing Jesus, but what color Jesus actually was. Uh, which is important because I'm tired of seeing Brad Pitt Jesus too, but uh, where will the logic ever get us? So I think it's important to challenge uh, the church so that we don't absolutize that the, our primary marker becomes who we are uh, in Jesus Christ. So that's some of what I tried to cover in the paper. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, faithful remnant, staying to the, the bitter end. The smarter ones are out there enjoying that good sun, but. You know, I've always found it helpful, a helpful exercise to paraphrase scripture that I happen to be studying at any given moment to clarify my interpretation of, of, of that passage. And I figure that if I don't try to, you know, uh, publish it as like new translations or the gospel according to Al, or some such thing. I'm not crossing too many lines. I mention this because after reading your paper several times, I was inspired to rewrite Paul's letter to Philemon, giving myself a lot of liberty. <laughs> so, if you'll allow me. <clears throat> Greetings, Phil. I hope you're doing well, my friend. I'm so thankful for you because of your strong faith and your love for everybody. You can't know how much that encourages me while I sit here in prison, knowing that you're leading the faithful in your house with truth and love. That's why I'm writing to you in confidence about a subject you probably don't want to talk about, but we simply must. It's about Onesimus. You may or may not know that he found his way to me, so I know it went down between you two. You'll, probably, you'll be happy to know that, though, that, that, that while he was here with me, he found Jesus. It might be hard for you to believe, but this guy is on fire. Now I know what the world thinks of slaves, that they're mere property, and furthermore, defined slaves are useless property. But Phil, I'm writing to tell you that Onesimus is beginning to live into his name, which, as you know, means useful and beneficial. And I'm not talking about useful and beneficial as a slave, but as a brother in the Lord and a servant of the gospel, just like us. In fact, I was tempted to just not say anything to you and keep him here, but I thought better of it. Well, based on his genuine faith and usefulness in the gospel, my strong request is that you not only welcome him back, but that you welcome him back as part of the family of God. I know what I'm asking goes against everything the empire tells us, but Phil, let's stick it to the man. <laughs> and show the world the power of the gospel that creates the kind of fellowship in which both slave and free worship together and treat each other with dignity and respect. I'm confident that you of all people can grasp this truth. Please share this letter with the rest of the church so that you can together practice the radical koinonia that the gospel calls us to. Oh, and whatever Onesimus did to have been rendered useless by you, and, or if he owes you anything, I'll take care of it. Do you remember when you said that you owe me everything? <laughs> if you meant that, then give me this one thing, that you welcome Onesimus into genuine fellowship and thus start a new kind of community that demonstrates to the world the equalizing power of the gospel. I hope to join you soon in that beautiful community I am imagining even now in your house. In fact, make a bed for me. I'm coming. 
Meanwhile, our mutual friends in prison here with me say hello. Take care of yourself, Phil, and God bless you all. Paul. This is the word of the Lord. No. Uh, <laughs> again, I, I find paraphrasing scripture to be a really helpful exercise, but, but I have to be inspired. And, you know, academic papers don't usually have that effect on me. <laughs> but Dr. Brogdon's paper did. It was brilliant in so many ways, not the least of which is the fact that it enlivened the book of Philemon. Philemon! <laughs> this unassuming letter consisting of a whopping 25 verses located toward the back of the Bible can easily be overlooked by the church. But in light of Dr. Brogdon's treatment of the text, for the church to neglect it would be a travesty. Who knew that this mini memo from Paul to Philemon and the church that meets in his house offers such a treasure of theological gold to help God's people achieve deep, intercultural, interclass quinonia. So thank you again. Uh, Brother Lewis, can I call you that? Because the church desperately needs guidance today as racism has made a vicious comeback. Not that it didn't that it ever left the scene entirely, but in light of the tragedy that happened at Mother Emanuel AME Church and the church burnings that occurred immediately afterward and the many other hate-based crimes that plague the news today, we can say that racism has reared its ugly head again in the ugliest of ways. And it's sobering and deeply disturbing to think that the traditional interpretation of the book of Philemon based on the slave flight hypothesis, has done its part in justifying the institution of slavery, or at least keeping intact the logic and structure of racism that makes slavery possible. Now, if I understand it correctly, the hypothesis, the, it, it refers to a reading of the text that basically views Philemon as the good guy whom Paul asks to take Onesimus, the runaway criminal slave, i.e. the bad guy, by virtue of Onesimus' newfound faith in Christ. And such an interpretation of the text, as Dr. Brogdon has shown, um, which has been the accepted interpretation, offered no challenge during slavery's heyday. Worse, it encouraged the Christianization of slavery. That is, the idea that slaves would be more hardworking, obedient, and compliant if they were Christian slaves. Though the institution of slavery in America is no longer, the slave flight hypothesis-based interpretation of Philemon is still the dominant one and thus continues to cultivate racism, which in today's volatile times will increasingly result in the likes of the Charleston tragedy. All the more why Dr. Brogdon's paper must be circulated which today means not just being published, but blogged and Facebooked and even cut up into hundreds of tweets. <laughs> For it has rescued the letter of Paul to Philemon from its racist yet generally accepted interpretation by offering a fresh rendering that is more consistent with the God whom we've come to know and love as the God of justice by utilizing what he calls the exclusionary koinonia hypothesis, Dr. Brogdon turns the tables. What if Onesimus was the good guy who ran away from duplicity and oppression and abuse at the hands of a Christian master who just didn't get it, whose understanding of fellowship did not extend to the slave community and therefore fell short of the truth of the gospel? What if Paul wrote this letter ultimately to challenge Philemon's racism by admonishing him to take the newly converted Onesimus back, no longer as a slave, but as a brother. This rendering of the text has Paul calling for something that the New Testament, if not all of scripture, calls for, namely a community of the redeemed where, quote, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male, female, for all of us are one in Christ Jesus, unquote. Indeed, Biblical faith calls the people of God not to conform to the world, 
which means in large part not to submit to the social hierarchical stratification of people according to race, ethnicity, and caste. Instead, we are to model an alternative community, a counterculture that forms relationships characterized by justice, equality, and reconciliation by the power of the gospel. Paul called Philemon to model this kind of all-inclusive fellowship by welcoming Onesimus and the other slaves, perhaps owned by other Christians in the church, as part of the family of God. Through this living letter, the Spirit continues to call Christians in positions of power and dominance to regard the powerless and marginalized as sisters and brothers in Christ, and thereby subverting racism, oppression, and other unjust systems of this world. As a Filipino-American teacher and denominational leader in international mission, let me also share a few practical quest uh, questions and issues that emerge in response to um, your paper. First, as a Filipino-American, and I, I specify my designation as, as Filipino over and against the more general Asian-American, because to be Filipino is more than, is, is, is more than being Asian. Uh, in fact, the Philippines is known as the Latin America of Asia. So as a Filipino-American who has also experienced being on the wrong side of racism, I had difficulty locating myself in, in, in the argument in your paper uh, because of the black-white divide that framed it. Indeed, as, as we discussed this morning and probably the last few days, most discussions on race in America are literally black and white, and there are valid reasons for that. But um, it can't be overstated that to achieve the kind of radical koinonia that this paper calls for requires using language that includes everyone. How can we prophesy against racism as well as champion justice, reconciliation, and radical koinonia in such a way that includes all tribes and nations and peoples and tongues? Second, as a teacher practitioner of holistic mission, which includes the Ministry of Reconciliation, I wanted to hear more about what Onesimus can teach African Americans and others who have been on the short end of the stick of racism. While the paper demonstrates what the Philemons of the world must do to overcome racism, what can be learned from Onesimus' example to instruct racism's victims? Third, as a teacher of Bible and theology, I'm inspired by this paper to interpret and teach scripture from the margins by being more open to fresh and liberating readings that promote justice, peace, salvation, and reconciliation. I get from this paper that the angle from which we read the text can change everything. So my question to myself, what hermeneutical tools are needed to remain true to the text while always advocating for the poor, oppressed, and marginalized in our use of the Bible? And lastly, as a denominational leader in international mission, I couldn't help but to apply the findings of this paper to the relationship between Western missionaries and the indigenous populations, raising all sorts of post-colonial issues that range from how to purge ethnocentrism and paternalism from the hearts of outgoing missionaries, to what genuine ministry partnerships should look like, to the ethics of hiring the indigenous as maids and gardeners. What would missionary training curriculum look like that includes addressing these sorts of issues? I suspect that we will never read Philemon the same way again, and we should be grateful for that. Part of the definition of a good academic paper is its usefulness, i.e. its onisimusness, <laughs> i.e. its ability to evoke practical questions, such as the ones that I've posed to myself. And now, to the task of living into the answers. Thank you. Well,
But, but part of the New Testament's vision of koinonia does transcend uh, the black-white binary. Uh, and the vision of the beloved community is where all, all God's people, all God's children come together. Uh, and so I'm excited about living into that vision. Uh, I will just say that I'm informed very much by uh, James Cone. I'm a bit of a Conite that says theology is contextual language. And when you do theology, you always start from your context. Uh, and so I'm sort of speaking from my context uh, and want to find ways to connect to my sisters and brothers in, uh, uh, in the human family. And so thank you for sharing that. I, I definitely want to hear that uh, and imagine koinonia in ways that go beyond that. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, 20 minutes for uh, questions at, at this point, if I have my timing correct, Klein. Um, so, uh, who is the, oh, Caleb has the microphone. Uh, questions for our speakers? Over here, uh, Dr. Chester. Uh, Stephen Chester. Um, I, I was fascinated by the paper because you know, I've encountered alternative readings of Philemon before from the traditional hypothesis, and they've always failed to convince me because they made Philemon some kind of authorized, it, it made Onesimus some kind of authorized agent of Philemon or of the church, and just in the way Paul writes, where there seems to be so much that he has to tell Philemon about what's going on, that doesn't seem very credible to me. Um, and so, you provided an alternative reconstruction that that uh, seemed to me to be, you know, more compatible with what we find in the text. Um, but in defense of those who've stuck with the traditional hypothesis all these years, um, one of the, the the things I think that pushes them in that direction is verse 18, uh, with Paul's reference to, you know. If Onesimus has has wronged you, or if he owes you anything, uh, charge it to my account. Uh, and so I think what I'm saying is, uh, I, I'm very attracted to your hypothesis, but I, I'd like to know more about what you do with verse 18. Okay. Great question. Uh, pretty much, I argued that I think that's a reference to um, the loss of revenue when you have a, a slave lo lo leave your leave your house. Um, that productivity that got lost when he left, Paul is saying, I will, I will pay that, which I still think puts an incredible amount of pressure upon Philemon when, when Paul is telling him, okay, uh, with this sort of unjust social arrangement, you know, I'll, I'll pay that. Not to mention that you owe me your very self, uh, which is, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's just putting an incredible, I mean, the rhetoric, you know, he's really trying to lead Philemon right to the edge and says, you know, because I want you to participate in this. I think this is something that, that transformed his life that I think even had a transforming effect on the church. Uh, and I will say that before Chrysostom got a hold of this letter, when people had the few discussions about why Philemon was even included in the canon, uh, a couple things stand out. One, because it was always included in the list of Pauline letters. And then secondly, because of the tradition of Onesimus becoming a bishop. Uh, of Ephesus. Now, of course, we don't know if it's the same Onesimus, but what a compelling reason to include it in the canon, that in the early church, a slave could become a bishop. Okay, that's the kind of reading that I think speaks to the church today instead of this runaway slave who, you know, gets sent back and, you know, we're kind of going to go along with it. So I kind of like that radical reading, but most New Testament scholars, that they're going to, they, they stick with that slave flight reading. Other questions? Alex, no. Hi, I'm Alex, a second year MDiv student. Um, so I just was going back to thinking about um, when you mentioned critical race theory and the importance of that becoming something that the church as a whole engages with and not kind of the educated elite and that kind of thing. Um, I was just wondering if you could say more about if there are specific um, boundaries or specific barriers to 
kind of um, speaking about critical race theory and whether there's some ways to, um, I guess, speak, in, speak about it in a way that makes it more palatable. I don't, I don't know if that's like a issue that you see. Absolutely. Uh, I would encourage, I always uh, in, encourage to take a sort of uh, multiple approaches to uh, addressing very complex and difficult issues in the church. Uh, I think the best way is always conversational. Uh, you can get a lot done sitting around a table with some food and talking that tends to lower defenses more than the s sort of formal presentations when people are sitting there, they're trying to get a read at you and what you're, you know, what you're trying to present. When you start with stories, when you start with a little bit about who you are, where you're coming from, and then bringing those insights into the conversation, that's a helpful beginning point. Um, so some of my most productive discussions about uh, issues of race have been over coffee, uh, over food, uh, and I know that's kind of, <laughs> Not, you don't get to maximize it because you don't get the full audience effect. But if one person changes the way they think, even in a small way, and then they share that with someone else, then we can imagine ways to create larger platforms and partnerships uh, to find uh, more, uh, I think, effective ways to, to take on some of this. So I, w I would just discourage, I would encourage that. I would also encourage maybe uh, seminars, workshops, Bible studies. Teach the Bible in a way that counters the ideology of race. So if another Dylan Roof is in your church, what are you going to say that's going to deprogram that nationalist crap he was getting off the internet in your Christian church? That's the challenge because someone is out there listening to us preaching and a lot of times we're not saying anything about relevant and important issues and they're just sort of sitting there with very destructive beliefs um, uh, and, and what they're doing with these things is very, very dangerous. Chris Papenfus, MDiv student, uh, one of the staff pastors at First Covenant in Omaha. Thank you. As, uh, as one who uh, stands before his congregation and preaches, that came through in your article, your desire to see that as a resource. I received that, so thank you. Uh, for that tremendously. It was wonderful. I was thinking and reflecting as you were sharing and, and you made the comment that um, uh, we're becoming more of a segregated society. I heard uh, Pastor, I believe it was Pastor Guy last night, uh, say that he would rather work with those in the secular community on issues of racism than those in the church, and that got an amen uh, from many in here. And that uh, the church continues to be, and on, from your observation, I believe you said, on a trajectory of greater segregation, which I also see. And so there's something that you're calling us to in here. I believe it's the koinonia that would allow us possibly in response when, when uh, any ethnic group is given the choice not to be in a forced conversation in society. They say, I'm going back to my people on a Sunday morning so I don't have to hear this, but we have to hear this. Um, so is there more in this fellowship as a pastor that I have to be pulling out uh, in order to say, you can't retreat here on a Sunday morning. Uh, we got to push this because it's, it's too important, and, and it's not happening in the secular environment because if it would, we'd be bringing it back into the church and rejoicing instead of escaping when we're given the choice to. I don't know if that makes sense. If you could help me oh, unpack yeah. a little more on the fellowship, oh. please. Thank you for your, uh, your, your insights. I mean, that's a lot to think about. But the power of koinonia is that as you are in this continual ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ, you are transformed. So Christian formation and Christian transformation is not, it, just, it doesn't just happen at conversion. It's ongoing. So as you are in this relationship, you are being changed. This is why segregated churches, it makes it hard for us to experience racial transformation because until you're with people in relationship, and it's messy. I mean, it is messy. Uh, it is painful. But if you're never around other people, people who are, who are different, People who sing different songs. That song sounds stupid. So, listen to it anyway. 
You know, I mean, it's just part of being together. I think we've yet to see what we can be because we can't enter into relationship. We, we, there is a kind of refusal, an obstinance, and for good reason. It's a bad history. It's a lot of pain, and people are continuing to die. But I, I believe the church has something to offer. It has a vision. It has, uh, and, and people are doing this all over the country. Um, there are people, white and black, who are falling in love with each other, and, and they have families, okay? The church ought to be listening to these people. How, do, how does that work? You, 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 know, uh, you know, talk about getting beyond black, white. I mean, there are, and, and, and I would say that people outside of the church, I think they're doing it a little better than we are. <laughs> uh, you know, I see people who don't want to have anything to do with the church, and they're hanging out with all different kind of people, and, and they're finding some creative ways to do that. So I think kind of to use a sort of marking hermeneutic that it's always the outsiders who kind of really get it. And we, and, we, and we really need to engage some of those outsiders because I think it's, it's some, of, some Christian arrogance that, oh, well, we, you know, we can figure this out on our own. Uh, I think we, we could benefit from some of those other voices and ways they're, they're navigating that. Hi, I'm Kelly Perez, and I'm an MDiv student here. Um, still trying to figure out this question exactly, but something that caught me when you said in the very beginning about how um, it's the hardest for like biracial and multi-ethnic people to f young people to find a place in the church. A lot of times, based on their own struggle constantly with identity of where they fit um, and how they um, can fit into a community, especially when it comes to to racism and the struggle, you know, the inner struggle that's happening there. And so I was wondering if you would just, I don't know, imagine and dream with me how the community of biracial, multi-ethnic people can be about the work of Konania because I feel like there's a niche there or a gift that we bring as like bridge builders. And I don't know how you see that kind of working into a way for us as we're learning out our own identity to give back to the church in that way. Yeah, I wanna say two things. One, that is a great question. I think many times in the questions that we ask, we find a calling. Um, and so I, <laughs> I, I want to encourage you to really to, to continue to reflect upon that and to think about that because I, uh, I suspect there will be opportunities for you to, uh, to exercise leadership in the church. So part of this is, and the second piece is part of it is we need new leadership paradigms. Okay, so. You know, I was this gung-ho, Afrocentric black scholar, and uh, I prayed and asked God to, to send me a wife because I was like, I don't want to pick a wife because if I do, I'm going to mess up, you know? <laughs> I'm going to, you know, be picking on stupid criteria. I need God to give me not what I want, but what I need. And I fell in love with a white woman. Okay, so how do you go with this Afrocentric, you know? <laughs> But I love her, and I know God sent her into my life. And we cannot hardly find a church to go to. And I've been a minister for 23 years. Black churches treat us like crap. White churches treat us like crap. When we go to restaurants on Sunday, Christians who just finished worshiping God look at us with disgust, like we have broken the most important moral law of the universe. We look at each other. This is my wife. This is Felicia. This is, okay. Uh, our connection goes beyond that. Uh, so we're experiencing a level of koinonia that, that Christians can't even imagine that that's even possible. How, <laughs> how can you love her? How can she love you? And it's like, and we serve a God that says, with God, all things are what? Uh, so I don't know if existing church mechanisms are going to accommodate what we're going to bring that's something i'm wrestling with whether i need to have an alternative mechanism because i believe there are a lot of people in the church who want to live into that vision and i believe i'm called to be a leader for them and there are others who they, they don't want to live into that and that's and i'm not for them and i'm okay for, with that
Hi, John Fogel. I'm Div. Um, so I really like what you said about the subversive language. Uh, the, the Paul subverting slavery. I, I love it. I love to think of Paul that way because I think a lot of time Paul gets a bad rap, um, especially when it comes to social issues. So, so how does the juxtaposition then play with, with that more overt language in Colossians, slaves obey your masters? Because that, that doesn't really seem subversive to me to slavery, and that's really, man, it's really troubling to me. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I started my journey doing master's level work, and you know, I heard a lecture on uh, on the Bible and slavery, and how the Bible was used to support slavery. Uh, I come from a very fundamentalist, very conservative tradition, high on the inerrancy of the text. So, I just couldn't handle that the Bible can be advocating for something that's wrong. So in my thesis, you know, I had to exonerate Paul <laughs> for, from the charge that, you know, he was defending slavery in any way. And the same could be said for, you know, things he said, he said about women, which are very problematic. But I, you know, so I did my best work. I exonerated Paul. And Marty Swords wrote one question at the end of my thesis. He said, is it, is it this easy? You know, so I did good enough work to get a really good grade with the thesis, but that one question stuck with me. So on to grad school I go. Okay, where you know, I really start drinking really deeply from the African American religious tradition uh, and found ways to show that the biblical text is more complicated with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's the stuff of incarnation, that you can be very, very radical and, and also very accommodating that you're gonna have the Bible saying some things that are very liberating and, and oppressive. Uh, I try to argue that what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to affect change within the, the, the realm of the church, the fellowship of believers, and he's not trying to take on the issue of slavery. Um, so he, he, he just adopts the house codes. Now, if you wanna have discussions about uh, authorship issues and whether Paul wrote you know, Colossians or whether that's you know, someone else, uh, I just argue that's beside the point. Uh, because he, you know, you, what do you do with 1 Corinthians chapter 7? You know, slaves remain as you are. Okay, so, so it's both radical and it's accommodationist. Now, you can't blame Paul for what the church and what history did with all that. He had no idea. Okay, but, it, but between that and then what Chrysostom and others start doing, it just established a trajectory. Uh, all they're doing is just, at the time, speaking to a particular issue but it established a trajectory that was very easy to just Christianize slavery, to just say it's okay. Um, and, we're, and we're sort of left with that legacy. How do we read Paul? Well, I, I, you just have to be honest. I think in places, I think Philemon, there's some radical stuff there. In other places, it's not. And I'm still wrestling with that, what to do with that. Hi, my um, name's Nawana, and I am an alum of the seminary and currently serving at the denominational offices. Um, I think just over the past couple of days, listening to all of the conversations, um, and really any time I get into this conversation about race and racism and reconciliation, um, I wonder, we talk a lot about integrating churches and having multi-ethnic churches, but I when I look at that, you can have, you know, people from all over who are coming and worshiping together, but when they leave, they go back and live in different communities. And I feel like a part of why it's not working or why these churches, you know, go back to being monoethnic after 10 years is because they're not fully doing life together um, in, in true community. And, you know, who are your kids playing with after school? Who are you inviting over to dinner? Who do you live down the street from? And I'm just wondering your thoughts, of, for both of you really, of, of how really like that, that idea of living in community as well as worshiping versus being commuter churches, like how do you see that factoring into this? I guess since I'm last, I'm getting ready to leave. Uh, I, can, I can be radical. Uh, I'm not sure if the congregational model is going to last very long. That with people pulling away from the, 
the sort of institution of the church and establishing more smaller networks and smaller communities where they can be more authentic, where they can be in intentional relationship with each other, I suspect that's a part of the wave of the future. That these big, because I mean, we, you thought that with the mega church phenomenon, we would have social transformation. We've got mega churches and social disintegration. Okay, so they're big cathedrals filled with people who are doing nothing, okay, to really affect change in, in communities. And so uh, millennials are really turned off from that stuff. They're not going to just go and sit up in big buildings and give all their money and, and listen to some big important guy who does not, they don't even know who they are. They're not for that. Okay, they're going to be, so the first century model, oh, they're house churches, okay, where people can get to know one another. I think that's where tra transformation is always local. Uh, now, I'm not saying, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor too, you know, I would... <laughs> I would love to pastor a big church <laughs> <laughs> that finds more authentic ways uh, for people to be discipled and to be in, in community with one another. So our ability to live into a new vision, I think is very much gonna be about reimagining how we do congregational life, which I think that model is broken um, and, and new models are emerging. just have to find um, deeper ways to be together and there's no real substitute for living together I'm, I'm an advocate and a practitioner of intentional Christian community and you know uh, I, I might be saying the same thing you are about the congregational model not not being the most uh, or, or not lasting maybe not maybe never being as effective as living together because you know every Sunday you get together it takes a long time to break the ice to become real if you ever get there. But try living with them. Try living with each other. <laughs> you know, you get there real fast. So short of all of us joining a, you know, a Christian commune, I, I, I really want to encourage all of us and each of us finding new and deeper ways beyond the local congregation to experience discipleship in Koinonia. On that thought, let's thank them. Sorry to have agenda anxiety, but he does have to catch a plane. <clears throat> uh, one thing that has been a subcurrent for all of the sessions is the relation of race and culture. But no one addressed it directly. I know several of you could have. And if anybody has a concise, crisp treatment of that topic, send it to me, and I'll consider including it in the journal. Because it seems to me Culture is as big an issue and bigger problem as the discussion of race may be a lot bigger. And it goes with that thing of living together. Uh, we have work to do. We have a number of people to thank, and I'll start with Caesar and Heather for what they have done for us. And I was just told a minute or two ago that uh, the YouTube clips are up on Cuff Church. Uh, Lord Sorry? Lord and there are over 200 people who have been uh, tapping into what we're doing. So keep it up. Uh, there are other people to thank, and I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, the uh, package that you received have evaluation forms in them and we uh, want to hear from you if you have suggestions as to what we will be doing. Let me go ahead and say in that connection that uh, next year the topic is science and religion. We are about halfway in terms of planning that topic. Uh, I'm a bit scared of it to tell you the truth because it's bigger than you can get your hands around. But we're working on it and uh, I also should tell you that next year will be the last year that I will be handling the, the process. Stephen Chester will take over in 2017 when the topic... <laughs> 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 yeah, 
You need to know Stephen and uh, Chris Spinks are associate editors for the journal, and we wouldn't, wouldn't not do this without them. But Lewis, in 2017, the subject is going to be participation in Christ. Uh, Stephen and I both are biased on that topic, but uh, you may want to come back. Uh, <laughs> the focus is union in Christ, and again, it uh, is one of those things that can change the nature of the church and the nature of our communities if we understand really what uh, is uh, happening with this. Uh, we want to thank the one person without whom this does not happen, and you've got to know that. She's standing right over there. and I've been doing this for what 15 years and I gotta tell you I have never had any difficulty dealing with this woman <laughs> she has made it easy and she's done a wonderful job so thank you you, you, with you? <laughs> you mind your own business <laughs> uh, <clears throat> to then the, our presenters and respondents we say thank you yes. you've been great And now, and now there's some directions for you. Uh, and make sure that we have all the information we need with regard to any expenses that have to be uh, covered or anything else that, that needs to be taken care of. With regard to editing your paper, I want you to feel free to edit it, make it better, add stuff, uh, tighten the argument. But if you address anything that your respondent addressed, do it either in a footnote or an excursus so that the conversation is clear to people who are going to be reading the journal. Uh, I, would uh, I would ask you to have the edited form to me by December 1. Uh, in addition, if you did not send an annotated bibliography of 10 items you would like for uh, pastors and church leaders to look at on this topic, please do so. Uh, I think that covers what we need to cover. Stephen, is there anything else I've left out? I don't think so. You have to pick up the problems if I do. <laughs> <laughs> then I would encourage you to make your way, way quickly to the chapel where our own Sun Chan Ra will be preaching. And uh, that will start quickly, so do not tarry. Thank you. Thank you.